Uh, we are in this series called Christmas Playlist. It's the jumpstart to our brand new series, Christmas Playlist. And we're going to look at the song, What Child Is This? So you know the song? What child is this who lay to rest on me? You know what? Yeah. Yep. It was written by William Chatterton Dix in 1865. William was a insurance manager uh, of the t- at the time, and he had contracted some kind of severe illness. It's very unclear exactly what that was. But through that, he kind of was like homestruck, bed stricken, and really had like a spiritual revival in himself. He got a Bible and was studying the Bible and reading it and having a relationship with God. And he was kind of poetic. So he was taking things that he was reading in the Bible and writing poetry. And he took the English folk song, Green Sleeves, and put his poem to it. So he didn't really write the melody to it. He just wrote the words and kind of stole somebody's song. So you could do that back in 1865. You can't do that in 2019. You'll get sued for copyright laws, right? But the Green Sleeves English folk song was written in the 1500s. Um, It's written from the text of Luke chapter 2, where it talks about baby Jesus being born in a manger and shepherds coming. And he, he kind of put that whole song together because of what he was reading and who he's experiencing with Jesus. Did you know that over 4 million babies are born in the United States every year? 4 million babies. The most popular day for babies to make their entrance into the world is Tuesdays. Tuesdays followed by Monday, and the lowest day of the week is Sunday, the most popular month to be born. Take a guess. It's not February, I wish. September. How many September babies in the house? All right. So that just means that your parents were probably snowed in in January, or the power went out, or something happened where they were snuggling up in January, right? When we think about all the newborn babies, four million a year, we have to ask a question. Why is this child that we're talking about, what child is this? Why is this child, the child that we celebrate every Christmas, why is he so special? Why is baby Jesus, born in Bethlehem, so special? I mean, four million babies enter the world every year, enter the United States every year, And we sing songs about one child born to a 14-year-old virgin somewhere in the Middle East. Think about this for a second. Why not, why don't we, why don't we sing songs about my kids? Right? Now ain't nobody singing a song about my kids. I mean, I wrote a song, I, I, I wrote a song for each of my kids, but it wasn't like Christmas Carol, anybody else was singing. Right? I can still remember the day that my oldest child, my firstborn child was born. I can remember walking down the hallway of Arden Hill Hospital. Anybody remember Arden Hill? Over here in Goshen, right? Arden Hill Hospital in the birthing wing, which is a beautiful birthing center. Walked down the hall, and there was this big window for the nursery with all these babies tightly wrapped like sausages, like pigs in a blanket, (laughs) wrapped up real tight, and they had pink blankets and blue blankets but all throughout the room and I can remember going to the window with anticipation looking in looking for the baby that looks like me right come on dads you know what I'm talking about that kid you're looking for the one that's got your nose like the family nose or has your ears like the family ears and as I'm looking through the entire nursery I mean, I knew that I had a girl, so I knew that it was going to be a pink blanket. I'm looking, and there's not a single baby in the nursery that looks like me. But I could pick out immediately which one was my child. As I scanned the room, it didn't take very long. I could recognize my child without somebody pointing it out, without somebody saying, oh, right here, McKelvey baby right? She was mine. There was no question whose child this is. There was no question what child is this. She was mine. 
although she looked nothing like me, I could see the features of my wife and her side of the family in this child, right? I could see those features because I'm so familiar with the features of my wife. I'm so familiar with the features of her family. You see, their genes are very strong and obviously my genes are very weak. Every single one of my three children look like my wife's side of the family. Now check this out. In John 1 verse 10, and I promise I'm going to bring this all together because we have two big ideas going right now. John 1 chapter 10 says this. Jesus was in the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all that would receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. This world, the earth that we live in today, is the earth that Jesus created. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And it says, everything that was made was made through him. And then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's saying, although he made the world, although he created humanity, his own creation did not recognize him. They didn't recognize him as the savior of the world when he came. You see, they were looking for a hero. They were looking for a warrior. They were looking for a king in a castle, a full-grown man, but were given a baby. Let's just think about this for a second. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. How old do you think Adam was when God created him? Well, God created Adam. He put him in the garden, right? Probably about 30 years old. Like, that's probably what he looked like, like a 30-year-old man, right? So he could do it. He could have created Jesus and put him on the earth as a 30-year-old man, king, warrior. He could have done it, but yet he chose to bring him as a baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger to a world that would not recognize him, could not recognize him. And I'm just going to tell you why they couldn't. They could not recognize him because they didn't know his father. You see, I could recognize my child because I knew the mother. I could pick out my child because I could see my wife's features in my child. The world couldn't recognize him as the Messiah because they didn't know God. They didn't know his father. They had customs, they had rituals, they had codes that they lived by, but they did not know the Father God. Because if they had known him, then John 14, 9 would work, right? Watch this. John 14, 9. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, watch this, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. You see, when you see God at work, we should recognize that it's God. Oh, come on, we're going to get into something here. He says, if you knew my dad, you'd recognize me. It's funny, as I, as I took over the church and became the lead pastor, my dad, my dad was the pastor for 37 years. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of things that went on with the transition where people weren't sure uh, if I was preaching the same way that my dad preached and stuff. And I was telling people, like, where do you think I learned everything I know? If you see my dad preach, then you get me. And if you see me preach, then you see how my dad is. The only thing different is my dad's about 4'10". No, I was kidding. My dad's 5'4". 
And he dresses a whole lot better than me. He wears suits and ties. I mean, that's, that's it. That's the only difference. It's the same gospel. It's the same Jesus, right? And he's saying, if you're hearing me, if you're seeing me, you've seen the Father. And if you've seen the Father, you know the Son. If you had known my Father, the world would have never asked, what child is this? If the world would have known the creator God, they would have never asked, whose child is this? And I propose today that many of your friends and your loved ones and your family members are just like those men and women of old. They know stories about religion. They hear, heard you talk about the old days of religion or whatever. They know how to dress for church or know how to dress for a wedding that's in a church. They might know some rituals and some pre-planned prayers. Like when I go and I do uh, public events, you know, I may do the whole, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I mean, they may know pre-planned prayers. But do they know God? I truly believe that we're in a generation that's looking for a real God. They're looking for something that they can actually believe in. Everything today teaches us that we actually can't believe in anything. We can't believe the news. We can't believe magazines. We can't believe people's social media because now we got filters on our stuff. Right? Someone takes a picture, they put 99 million filters. Man, they look amazing. Then you see them in real life. Yay! Uh! I put the filter back on. All right, we're not allowed to talk like that in church. People are, people are looking for a real God. Something true and living that they can believe in that gives their life a purpose and gives their life a meaning, Right? but they have not yet met Jehovah God. Jehovah God. Here's what I know. I've been in church my entire life. My dad founded this church in uh, 1982. I was three years old. We were downtown Middletown, an old J.J. Newberry department store for many years, but we started in the Holiday Inn over on East Main Street. We'd rent that out, and once that got big... Uh, we, had, we had to move, we had to get a building and all that kind of stuff. I've been, in my ch- I've been in church my whole life, back when we had pews instead of chairs, and I'd fall asleep on the pews because I was in church so much, and I'd fall asleep under the pew, and I'd fall asleep in the offices, and it was like I was in church all the time, and I knew everything about church. I knew everything about praise and worship. I knew when we had to stand up, when we had to sit down. I knew how to do the dance that we did back then, back in the old days. I knew all of that. I knew the memory verses. John 3, 6, you forgot something about. I could, I could do the sword drills. I knew all 66 books of the Bible. Just Exodus, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Joshua, Ruth. I could say it all. But there came to a point in my life where although I knew everything there was to know about God, I realized that I didn't know God. I didn't know God. He hadn't become mine. He was my dad's religion. He was my dad's faith. He was the sermons my dad preached about. And some of us, I think, we had our parents' religion. I was watching online, maybe you have some form of a belief system, but you don't yet have God. Because when God becomes yours, like I'm standing at the window, looking in the nursery, and I'm saying, that one's mine. That baby's mine. When God becomes yours, something happens. Things change. When God becomes yours, you can then begin to recognize God at work in your life. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. I mean, this is deep, man. You can begin to recognize God. Oh, there he is. Oh, there's God. Oh, there's God. Because he's yours. 
So, so, so when money's tight and you're like, I don't know how we're going to pay the bills and you go to the mailbox and there's a check in the mailbox, some refund from like property taxes from like six years ago from a house you forgot you owned, all of a sudden you got this check that pays the bill exactly what you need in time. You can say, oh wait, there's God. There's God. Or when you're having a really crummy day and you're down and one of your friends says, hey man, thinking about you, love you. And they text you at just the right time when you're feeling down. Or your friend calls you on the phone. Right when you're about to let stupid out the box. Right when you're about to do something dumb. And you know that you've already surrendered that to God. But you're still about to, I'm about to do this. They're like, hey bro, what's up? What you doing? Uh, why? What do you know? No, not, man. Let's go hang out. Let's go grab a cup of coffee. There's God. God is at work in these things, but, but you can't recognize God until he's yours. We ask this question, what child is this? Because he's not ours. He's not ours. <laughs> mm. This idea of knowing God, the word know God in the Greek is the word ginosko. Ginosko. It means to know someone in a way that a husband knows a wife. And we don't mean that in, in, in the act of knowing the wife to, to produce children. We're saying in the way that a husband knows a wife that they are connected emotionally and spiritually. That they are connected as one. The Bible says that when uh, a, a husband and wife get married, that the two become one. This is the word ginosko. They know one another. They're connected emotionally and they're connected spiritually. This is when over time in your uh, relationship, you, your significant other walks in the house and immediately you notice something's wrong. They didn't have to say anything. They didn't have to do anything. Just by looking at them, the energy that they're putting off, something's wrong because I'm connected to you. I sense, I feel, I know something's off. I'm going to help somebody real quick today. Uh, that you, You've dealt with this in your, in your own home. Uh, one of you come home and you walk in the door and, and you're already home and this person walks in the house and they're just in a mood, right? They're in a mood and they just go off on you for no reason. Why are all these shoes in front of the doorway? I'm going to trip and break my neck. Right? You Come on. Act like you ain't never had that. And, and instead of just saying, hey, you okay? It's not like you to come home and do that. We, we don't. We elevate. We match them. What do you mean? Just kick them out of the way. <laughs> now we got this fight for no reason, right? If, if we just simply said, hey, is everything all right? Something happened on the way home from work? You having a bad day? Because I'm here for you. Because I'm, I'm here for you. Right? Come on, I just helped somebody. Somebody's been doing this for a long time, right? It's this gnosko is knowing in a way that we're connected emotionally and we're connected spiritually. And I want to throw out today, do you know God? Or are you still standing on the sidelines asking, what child is this? I'm throwing that out there online today. Do you know God in a way that you're connected to him emotionally and you're connected to him spiritually? Are you connected to God in a way that when you're at the mall or out at a restaurant or something, you, f you sense, I need to pick up this person's meal. Has it ever happened to you before? I need to pay for this person's meal. And you don't know why, and you're like, Lord Jesus, look how much they ate. I spent five dollars on me. But could you say, well, here's God. Here in this moment, God is leading me to pay for somebody's meal. Huh? I know. I, I know if I take a minute, rabbit track. Uh I love blessing people. I love watching people bless each other. And, and one, one time I was preaching about 
uh, someone walking up to me and they gave me a hundred dollar handshake. And I was like, oh man, this is awesome. Like someone just came up to me, shook my hand, gave me a hundred dollars. It was amazing. Blah, blah, blah. But I didn't actually need it. I didn't need that hundred dollars. Now there were other times that I had prayed and I'm like, Lord, I need some money, man. I need a breakthrough. I need something. I ain't going to have no lunch money this week. But in this moment, I didn't need it. And the Bible says that there's a, there's a seasons and times when you will receive seed to sow and bread to eat. There are times when you need to know that you received the blessing that you didn't really need and that and God's just using you as a vehicle to pass it along to somebody else. But there's also times that God's saying, no, I'm blessing you because you need this for where you're going. And wisdom is going to say, God, is this one for me? For where I'm going? Or is this one for me to pass along to sow on to somebody else? So I was preaching about this and someone came up to me and they said, well, you know, that's great for you, but no one's ever given me a hundred dollar handshake. I'm like, well, you're not getting this one. <laughs> but have you ever given one? Have you ever given one? Well, no. Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Give, and in the measure that you give, it will be given back to you. It's just so funny that people want to give one dollar, and God give them a million dollars. He says, in the measure that you give, in the measure, right? A measure is like a, a measuring cup. In the measure you give, it will be measured back to you. So you, you give it a dollar handshakes, expecting hundred dollar handshakes. I'm just throwing this out there. This is some free stuff for you today. Not even in my notes. But can we recognize when God is at work in our lives? Watch this. In James 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Why? Because you've seen me. He's telling us, if you've seen the Father, you've seen the Son. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. So what does this all mean? What's this whole song about? What are we building this up to? We've got to close out by looking at Luke chapter 2. What this song is really about. Luke chapter 2, in verse 8, it says this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, I just got to break this down real Middletown style. Is that all right? Because I think that we get a little religious when we read this. Oh my God, think about how amazing, like the heavens opened up, and there were angels there, and the light shone around them. Why were they afraid? All right, let me just ask you this. Right now, Middletown, we're walking down North Street, and all of a sudden, a UFO, a UFO comes over our head. Come on, just listen for a second. And all of a sudden, laser beam lights shone all around us. And a door opened up, and this creature just steps out. No, 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 no. <laughs> Yo, you're gonna be afraid right you're gonna be afraid we can't we can't over spiritualize this moment they didn't know what was going on they didn't know this was an angel they didn't know this wasn't a, a what, what was it alien they didn't know that do not but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Whew. We're not being abducted. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. That's what he's saying. Let's pause there. Whether you believe what just happened or not, whether you believe that the angel spoke to them, that they're saying, we want to give you proof that what we're saying is true. Watch. Um, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes or in clothes, lying in a manger. 
When he said that, suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men are for those who his favor rests. Then the angels left. I'm telling you, that was a scary situation. We don't know that these were believers. We don't know that they believed in God. We just know they're shepherds out in a field and all of a sudden they have an encounter with God. And I'm telling you, when you have an encounter with God, everything changes. When you have a real encounter with God, not not, not hearing about a religion, not hearing about a faith, but when you have an encounter with God, that you feel something inside of you, there's no doubt that it was the Lord. Now watch this. Watch this. Um, When the angels had left them, watch. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. In this moment, we don't know that they know anything about God. We don't know that they know anything about Jehovah or belief system. But in this moment, they went from being afraid of aliens to saying the Lord has spoken. The Lord has spoken. And I'm throwing this out there today that with this first carol of the season that we're looking at, we have to ask a question. Is there a God? And does he want to have a relationship with me? These wise, these, not these wise, these shepherds ask this question. We have to go see if this is real. We have to go see if this is real. Is Christianity real? Is Jesus real? And if he is, if I find at the end of this quest to say, yes, Jesus Christ is real. He's Lord. He's Savior. He's Creator. He's Messiah then I have to do something with that information. Watch this. So they hurried off. I love that. So they hurried off. They hurried off. They didn't say, well, you know what? I think we can fit it in our schedule around four o'clock. Yeah, I think that'd be good. We'll we'll wait, we'll chill out till four o'clock. Go check this out. No, no. It says that they hurt. There was an urgency. Wait a second. We just had a, an experience with God. The presence of the God uh, of God showed around us. He told us what to do. We need to act on this. I got to tell you, this. is there an urgency in your spirit to share your faith with those who are lost around you? I got a I got a text message this week. A lady in our church, her father had a massive heart attack. Were, was hit or miss for many, many hours, not sure if he was going to pull through or not. Went through several procedures to bring him back and, and, and to redo some things in his heart. Took him down to Westchester Medical Center. And we're just kind of waiting to hear, right? We're just waiting to hear what was going on. And she texted me a little bit later. And she said, my dad came to church two weeks ago. And as you closed out the message, my dad raised his hand and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. She said, so no matter the outcome of this current situation, I have peace that my father knows Jesus. So what, Pastor Mike, you do an altar call, you do a salvation call every week? We had one shot at reaching that man. We had one service, guys. We had one service to preach a gospel in a way that was life-giving and brought the presence of God to a place where this man says, I need to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, this is the urgency by which our staff operates, that we have one Sunday to reach someone who's far from God and bring him into a relationship with him. They said, if this is real, we've got to go investigate. We've got to go investigate. Watch this. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, when they were convinced that it was true, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. 
See, once they knew, once they experienced it, someone else has to know this too. Someone else has to experience this freedom. Someone else needs this everlasting life that I have. So, if there's a God that desires a relationship with us, then we need to go investigate that option. As human beings, just baseline human beings, if we believe there's a God out there that created the universe, that means that he created us with purpose. It demands that we investigate that option. Who is he? What belief system is right? What's God's name? What did he do? What does he want from us, right? We have to ask these questions. And then secondly, if we find that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, if he proves to be our Lord and our Savior, then that calls us to a deeper conviction. And that conviction is, I need to share what I found. I need to share my truth. I need to share my truth in a way that is not bossy. I need to share my truth in a way that's life-giving. I need to share my truth in a way that someone else can say, I found my faith because you found your faith. What child is this? So I say, the Christ child is here. Mary and Joseph, they're in this manger. It's probably more like a cave. It was more like a cave underneath the house that they would put their animals in. That's kind of what Jesus was born in. Mary and Joseph sitting there with this baby. Now what? Now what? What do I do with God in my life? What do I now do with Jesus? What do you now do with your faith? What do you now do with the fact that you know or you don't know that you possess the answer to eternal life. What do we do with this child? So it's not so much what child is this, it's now that I know of this child, what do I do with him? What do I do with the knowledge of this faith? I'd like to pray to you today. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for this time together that we could brave the weather to connect with each other. We could be a community, a family. And Lord, as we leave here today, I thank you that we're protected and safe. But Holy Spirit, I ask you right now in this moment that if there is someone in here today or watching online that finds themselves far from God, that you would tug at their heart today. You tug at their heart in a way that right now they're experiencing the presence of God inside them. There's this uncomfortable tugging or pulling, almost like in their stomach, in their chest. And God, that you're calling to them today. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of life, or you're watching online and you've never prayed a prayer of salvation, we'd like to offer that to you today. And here at Family Church, we just pray a prayer together out loud, and it goes like this, if you'd say it with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Hey, if you prayed that for the very first time today, could you just grant me the permission to celebrate you for just two seconds? Could you just wave at me real quick and say, hey, that was me, Pastor Mike. I prayed that for the very first time today. Anybody at all? I know we're a small crowd, but over there, awesome, man. Awesome. Anybody else real quick? All right, if you're online, wave at us online. Send us a text message or an email. Let us know that you made a decision for Christ. There's a booklet on the seat back in front of you. It says, welcome home. That is our gift to you. Uh, before you rush out, uh, well, don't rush out. Go slow out because it's a little icy. We have the sidewalks co- um, covered with salt. Um, if you came here looking for something today, a hug, a handshake, a friend, a connection, prayer, don't run out of here until you get what you came here for, all right? I mean, this is one of those snowy days, so we do what we want. We take a long time. But if you need prayer, we have prayer partners. I'll be here at the front in a second. Uh, if you're new here, if it's your first time, or you want prayer in a private place, you can go to one of the tables in the back. Um, but just 
take a moment. Like if there's something that you need today, don't just rush out. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word that it will never return to you void, but will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Lord, today. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. We thank you for your protection and your safety upon us as we travel today. Lord, everything we set our hands to, we'll prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you.